Welcome to the latest edition of the Hudson County Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Haig, and with me today is, can't say a special guest because he was with us last week, but we are now finishing up our conversation with the one and only Rashawn McLeod. And Rashawn, we, we left off last time talking a little bit about uh, your days at St. John's and then your, your uh, decision to leave St. John's. And you said that you already knew by the time that that season was over that you were leaving. Is that correct? Okay, and what was the what was the thought process there? Just didn't feel comfortable, didn't feel like it was the right fit, or did you want to get away? What was you know what was the thought process with you leaving uh, St. John's? Um, I just I felt like I wasn't really learning uh, at the rate that I was learning when I was playing so early. Um, yeah, having been so young in the game um, and learning so much in such a short period of time, uh, I just felt like I was. It felt like I was going backwards, and I was changing the trajectory of who I was as a player, and um, started to lose a little bit focus on uh, what type of player I was thought I was supposed to be, and, and moving in the direction, um, of, you know, towards a different type of player. So uh, I, I just didn't feel like I was being used properly. I didn't feel like I was uh, getting an opportunity to show what I what I was capable of doing. So that led to to okay, now, now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and I, and I think everybody and their mother all thought that you were considered to be an inside player, that you were uh, a four or maybe a five, and I think in your heart of hearts, you thought that you were more of a three, and did you think that that, it was that part of the process as well, is that you were being misused as being a player, that you, you, you felt like you were more of a three? No, it wasn't necessarily a position thing. It was just a, a, a information thing. Um, okay. You know, I, I felt like I was a basketball player. I, did, I didn't necessarily give myself. I played the four and the five because that's what my skill set said I could be. But I knew I could be whatever type of player I put my mind to. And I just felt like I was being pigeonholed into being one specific type of player instead of, you know, uh, learning and, uh, and, and adding to my skill set to be able to play basketball okay I uh, now and and the, the year that you had to sit out and I think we said this on the last time uh, that we were together um, I remember going to see and you, you know where I'm going I remember seeing you at uh, at uh, White Eagle Hall and making a joke because you were standing outside and gonna shoot a three and I said come on Rashad you can't hit that shot and you just stepped up to the three and not only hit one, but I think it was 21 in a row that you hit from three. And then finally, I, that shut me up. And I was like, okay, you can hit that shot. <laughs> was, was, are you, were you already in your heart of hearts knew that you could shoot the three-pointer by that point? I mean, even in high school, I could shoot. I had a soft touch. I mean, Coach Hurley and I worked in Danny. And, you know, we're doing Coach Haas and Gary Pinter. Like, we really worked on my technical uh, ability to shoot. Um, and then I just had I, I, the only reason I didn't shoot a lot of jump shots in high school was because I had other guys to do it. Right. And I, I just didn't get enough reps uh, in game situations to feel comfortable enough doing it. So I stayed away from it. You know? Okay. Um, my senior year of high school, I shot seventy one percent from the field. <laughs> yeah, because you shot because you shot from four feet and in. That's all, right. you know. I shot from six feet. And in. <laughs> right. But that was if I had if I had took it upon myself to shoot jump shots all the time and I didn't make them, my career could be, I could have taken it, it could be very different. <laughs> okay. That's, you know what? That's correct. It could have been because no, I think you were being recruited as being a power forward or, or even a center and, right. you know, you, you surprised everybody by being more of a, a perimeter say, player. Okay. I mean, I was, my game was more geared towards what the stretch four and the, the guys are of today, um, you know, where I can shoot the long ball and, you know, get, get, you know and, and still be able to make plays off the dribble some, but be, still be able to guard guys bigger than I was. Um, that was the thing that 
separated me, I was probably a little bit ahead of my time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I agree that you were ahead of your time because if you had, um, like say for instance, now you'd be uh, a major commodity, a major commodity. Yeah, I'd, I'd be, you know, I think I could, I, in today's game, I could, you know, be, I'm not going to say a perennial all-star, but I could have I made an all-star team. All right. If, if I was playing it today because of the way that uh, my game was geared. Uh, and, but the good thing is, even though they don't, I could post because of my background. Right. You know what I'm saying like I was a mis I was a mismatch for a lot of teams that I, that I played against because depending on who you had guard me, I had so many different tools of um, inside, outside, mid range, uh, long ball. You know, I, I just played I played the game based on who was guard. Yeah, no. You know, so I didn't try to do one thing over and over and over again because I was good at it. What I did was I took I looked at the opportunities that were in front of me. And I, and I took advantage of him. If a smaller guy, because of my quickness, was guarding me, and he was quicker than me, I'd take him in the post. Okay. If a big guy was guarding me because he was, I was taking care of the post, I, I would take him to the wing. So, you know, I just did, you know, when they say take what the defense gives you, I just try to put the defense on the island and force them to have to make changes to me as opposed to me making changes to them. That's, absolutely, and that's exactly what you did. Now, talk a little bit about the decision to go to Duke. And did you know that right away? Now, I know for a fact that Coach K um, recruited you a little bit coming out of high school and that you were interested in Duke and that you had the grades to go to Duke. So, um, you know, uh, was that part of the process as being a transfer? Or did you realize at that time Duke had never taken a transfer player before? You were the first ever Duke uh, player that came as a transfer. So was that, um, you know, were you a little concerned about that? What a little bit about the recruiting process that you took the second time around? Um, well, originally I was just going to transfer to Arizona. Duke, Duke kind of came in late, and, uh, and but obviously it's Duke, so you got to give it a chance. Um, so I put, the, I, I put the break on a little bit and saw, you know, looked to see what opportunity that Duke had to offer. And Grant Hill was graduating, Tony Lang was graduating. They had all the guys that looked like the position were, were leaving. And so what I saw was an opportunity, um, you know, for me to come in and, and bring Duke back to the prominence that they've always had, you know, from their championship days. But knowing, uh, you know, watching Duke as a youngster, I always knew that coaches, one of coaches' favorite positions was to stretch four. You know, the Christian Lakers and you know, the forwards that could step out and do some things. So I looked at it as an opportunity to play for the at the time I thought it was an up and coming great coach, um, who was very similar to what I was used to at St. Anthony. Um, and Arizona was they won the national championship that year <laughs> that I transferred, but right. they had Jason Terry, they had Mike Bibby, they had Miles Simon. You know, I would have never saw the basketball probably. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I looked at the balance between the, 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 you know, the opportunity to play, but also the opportunity to grow um, and my impact on the, on the, on the team and the, and the, uh, the, the I guess, the, the school. You know, okay. I mean, like, you know, I, I was always playing, I, you know, playing at St. Anthony's historic program, going to St. John's historic program, you know, Duke's an historic program. So with them being down and having that bad, you know, that down year, I was like, man, if I, I would be at the top if I could help bring this program back to the, the dominance that it once had. So that was my thought process. Okay. But it, it certainly didn't hurt that having Coach, Coach Krzyzewski there. And, uh, you know, no, no, and, uh, and also the fact that you were familiar with them because they recruited you coming out of high school, correct? Correct. correct. Okay. And, and we ran, and at St. Anthony's, we ran a lot of the same style of offense. You know, I mean, obviously ours was a little bit less elaborate than theirs, but I, I, I still was, uh, I had the fundamentals of the type of offense that they ran. Yeah. Okay. Now, what was it like for you to be 19 years old? And for the first time since you were a freshman in high school, you were not playing basketball. I mean, yeah, you played like in pickup games or you you practiced and all, 
but you weren't playing in games. And how difficult was that to sit out that year and not play? And sit there and watch your teammates play. It was very difficult because I was able to play in the blue-white game. <laughs> and when I played in the blue-white game, and I ended up scoring like 29 points in the blue-white game. <laughs> did you really? Okay. I did. And, uh, and then after, and then the follow-up would happen to sit out um, right after that. It, it, it made it difficult because... You know, we, we, I think we finished that season. I sat out 16 and 15 or something like that. Oh, yeah. wow. Duke lost 15 games that year? Was yeah. that the year that yeah. Coach Krzyzewski, yeah. that was the year that he got Coach sick? Came back. Coach came back that year. And uh, the, year, the year that Coach was out, they were 14 and, and 16. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but, and, uh, but, you know, it was Chris Collins and Jeff, uh, Jeff Cable. Chris Collins' senior year. And... Uh, I think yeah, I think they were. I think we finished like sixteen or fourteen or something like that. A little bit over five hundred. And I just, you know, I would be there at every game at home, and I would think to myself, man, if, if I was playing, I could have made a difference. Um, and, and so it was very hard to be out there and watch my my teammates play, and as hard as we played to not be able to help them uh, win those games, especially the ones that were close. Okay. All right. Um. Did that make you more determined when you came back to play it, 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 again? It showed, it showed the need for a guy like me with my skill set. You know, um, you know, the following year, uh, my junior year, playing. Yeah, but that, but then between between that year when you sat out, you came home. Correct, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, and you played in the Jersey Shore League. And you had an a tre tremendous summer, and that's when all of a sudden people are saying, "Wow, he's a you know he's a stud, and right?" And people started to believe that I could be a pro, right? Um, and it was it was really good. Because the Allen Hurst Barbers, right? Was that the Alan team you Hurst played for? Barbers, that's right. Yeah, Brian Doherty, yeah. Guys. <laughs> it was. Uh, well, was you can't you can't uh, say Rashawn McLeod without Brian Doherty. I mean, it's it's almost like that. Those are two names that have to be to, you know almost together. They're they're synonymous. They're synonymous. Right. Come along together. So, you know, but that that summer, man, you know, I got to play against Anthony Mason and you know a bunch of those guys from New York and the Nets, Jason Williams, Rick Mahorn, all those guys all summer long. Yep. It, it it really enhanced me as a player because I knew what to expect. And then Bobby and our team was stacked. We had Brendan Knight, Bobby Early, Kevin DeHair, Robert Rose, you know, Danielle Marshall. I mean. That was a pretty good team. <laughs> and so playing with those guys and under, you know understanding the game at, at that at that time, it really helped me. I mean, I think I averaged about thirty-five points a game that summer. That's and right. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was one of the top. I would probably say one of the top five players in the league from a statistical standpoint. But I was I wasn't even close to my potential yet. Okay. But that's what that's what opened up the eyes. Everybody started to say, "Wow, was Sean McClark is playing and play at the high level?" There's no question. Yeah. You know, the question was, was if he's leaving St. John's and he wasn't playing, why is he transferring to Duke? <laughs> right. That's exactly what the question was. You know, like, and you were leaving St. John's where you were only averaging like eight a game, eight, nine points a game. Like, what are you going to expect to be at Duke? You know, like, where, where, how far down the bench are you going to be at Duke? And obviously, we all were wrong because that wasn't the case from the beginning. So when we look at statistics, if you look at the last four games at St. John's, when I did, get, I got a little bit more time at the end playing about, I went from playing about nine minutes a game to about 16 minutes a game. And even though I averaged eight points a game, I only played 11 minutes a game. Right. And oh, you weren't playing at all. Yeah. I wasn't playing that much. Right. When, I, when my minutes went up and I went to 16 minutes a game, I, I started averaging about 12 points a game. And right. I just that. And even at Duke, I averaged 23 minutes a game at Duke my whole career. But I have 16 and a half points a game. <laughs> so if I played as a first team all region, I mean all ACC guy and a third team all American, if I played 30 minutes like every every everybody else, you know, I'm, I could have averaged easy 20, 20, 25 points a game. Right, but you that's know? not Shishevsky's doing. He doesn't, right. you know, he doesn't let people play that much. Right, we did it by committee. Right. All right. So, so that was that was the fun part, understanding, and you know, but it was also the way that I thought and the way.
way that I was raised as a player, I didn't need to do it by myself. You know what I'm saying? Like I, at St. Anthony's, I didn't have to do it by myself. So I didn't. I wasn't the type of player where I wanted all of the glory, every shot. I just wanted to win. Right. When it was more important than the stat line at the end of the day. Okay. And right away, you fit in like a glove at Duke, even maybe more so than anybody could have expected. But you, in your heart of hearts, probably knew you were going to do that well right away, correct? Yeah, I mean, I had no doubts that, you know, I would fit in, and, you know, watching the guys play, looking at the film, having watched them in high school and the way that they play. I had no doubt that I would fit in perfectly with Coach's philosophy because it was very similar to Coach Herb's. And, and I knew what to expect. Um, I, I, at St. John's, I, it was day to day. I didn't know what to expect. Right. Like, am I going to play? Or are they going to cave into Felipe? Or, you know, am I, you know, not being a New York guy and, and being a Jersey guy on a team of New York guys? It was like, I didn't know what to expect. And, and so I didn't know what to prepare for. When I got to do, um, I knew exactly what I was working on. And when I did it, I, I was given an opportunity to present it and show it. Okay. Hey, Ross, i got to ask you, um, was there any added pressure on you knowing fully well that you were the first ever transfer player in Duke history? Um, um, and I mean, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, considering the fact, okay, they never, they never expect, they never allowed one before, they never had one before, and now all of a sudden, you know, Duke, um, Coach K lessens up his, uh, his, um, his requirements, I guess, a little bit, and allows you to come in as a transfer. And was there any pressure at all on you, undue pressure, so to speak, being the first ever transfer, like, okay, I better perform? I didn't feel any pressure. But, um, you know, the, the more I, you know, when I talk to people, they would, they would criticize me for Absolutely. Until we got Shane Badley, I was the I was the one guy that did what I did. And so I knew that as long as I did it on a consistent basis that I would I would have the opportunity to get out there and play and, and Scott's you know, Scott was the limit. Okay. Alright, and um what was it like the first time around you playing in the ACC? And obviously, you know, the Big East was the Big East, but ACC is like, you know, every, you know like, say, for instance, in when you were playing for St. John's, you were the second game in town. When you're playing in, you know, on Tobacco Road, you're the only game in town. And, and how, you know, how wild was that the first time around when you were started playing all those teams? Like, you know, Carolina and Wake Forest and, and NC State and, you know. Yeah. Uh, Carolina was loaded, Vince Carter and Jameson and, you know, Maryland was, I mean, we had about nine teams in the top 25 at that time, so ACC was very competitive, and it was really, really difficult, but it was very, it, the simulation of it was closest to being prepared for the NBA as you could be at that time. Uh, Florida State was really good, they were top 25, yep. Clemson was top, top 10, top 5 at times throughout the year. Uh, NC State was top 25 at the time. That's you know sometime throughout that year. So you know going through that. And the, the, the cool thing was was we only lost one. I lost one regular season ACC game both years that I was at Duke. Is that true? Only one? Yeah. Wow. Regular season, we won back to back regular season championships. Um, Carolina was the only team we split with Carolina both years. So that was the only team that I lost to during the regular season. Um, well, no, and Wake, and Wake Forest once with Tim Duncan. So I lost three games in two years during the regular season. That, well, that's amazing in itself. So, um, and, and, 
And how how great was it to how great was it to play in the ACC at that time? Um, you know, every single night you could you know, there were no nights off. You couldn't you couldn't rest. You know, Wednesday, Saturday, boom, boom, and every single game was on national television, and you were you know you were under the microscope every single time you took the court. Oh yeah, it was it was uh, you know obviously I had more exposure in ACC than I did in the NBA playing regional for the whole. <laughs> Sure. Um, so you know, being the being the big ticket man, it was like every time you played on 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 a, a game, the whole world was watching. So it wasn't just regional. I mean, our games were being broadcast in China and different places like that. So um, you know, so the, the, the pressure to perform was high, but we were so prepared that it didn't bother us much. You know what I mean? So we were out there, and you know. Everything else outside of that game was the second. You okay. know, like we didn't think. Uh, Coach really taught us how to focus on one game and one game because when we would be, like say we had Carolina coming up, but we would have to play Georgia Tech, who was ranked in the top 25. We'd have to play NC State, and they ranked in the top 25. But the reporters would ask, how are you, how are you guys preparing for the Carolina game? <laughs> And it's like, dude, we got two games before this. We don't even see them right now. And so, Coach did a really good job preparing us for um, those moments so that we can stay focused and, and, and really just go out and win the game that was in front of us. Okay. Um, and what, what was Krzyzewski like to, to play for as a coach? Now, and this is probably going to be the toughest question I'm going to ask you in, in, in everything. Who was a tougher coach to play for, Hurley or Krzyzewski? <laughs> Man, I, I would probably say both. Both. Oh, see, you dodged it. You do dodged the question. You say so, both. This is, this is why I say both. All right. At the time I was playing for Coach Hurley, my expectation of what a good coach was, I had no idea. It wasn't until I, I went through the Coach Hurley experience that I knew because that was my decision to transfer from St. John's. I wasn't getting from my coach what I needed. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't know until I left St. Anthony's. I had no idea what a coach was supposed to be doing. I just thought that's what Coach Hurley did. Every coach did. But that's not true. No. <laughs> no. And so having gone through the Hurley experience and then gone through the K experience, it really opened my eyes to what a big, what a great coach is supposed to be doing for his players on a day to day basis. So I had something to compare coach to. Coach, you know, if all of my coaches after I left to Coach Hurley, but prior to that, I don't have one experience with Coach Hurley. And, you know, everything was run with his program the way that it was always run. And then I played for Rich Leary, who had a similar concept to Coach Hurley. Uh, so I didn't really have much difference other than the best coach. So, until I was able to see a coach that didn't have the same approach to the game, which is and thank God, I wasn't I wasn't made, I didn't know what the coach could compare that. Yeah, but but think about it. How lucky were you? You got to play for the all time leader in coaching victories on the high school level and the all time leader in coaching victories on the collegiate level. I don't yeah, I don't know if there's I don't know if there's many of that, that I don't know if there's many that did that other than Bobby, right? Oh, that's right. You played for Lenny Wilkins. <laughs> so yeah, that that's that was that was great, man. I mean, <laughs> to, to to play for and then you know Larry Brown is I think second or third on that list. Yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> so to play for those types of coaches my whole career, man, was a blessing for sure. 
There's no question. All right. So uh, your junior year was a, was an incredible year. You made first team All ACC, and, and you figured, okay, you could rest on your laurels. But no, you worked harder, and uh, you got even better as a senior, and became first team All ACC again, and third team All American, and. Uh, you know how, how you know. Talk a little bit about that 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 summer between your junior year and your senior year. Did you just have to push yourself even that much harder because you knew you couldn't rest on your laurels? Well, yeah. I mean, with with the amount of uh, progress that I made at my junior year, um, I still saw some holes in my game defensively, not being in the best shape that I could possibly be in, playing against specific guys. Uh, so it really opened my eyes to how much more work I needed, I needed to do. Um, and then there was a trip that I took. It was the ACC All-Star uh, team that was put together. Uh, this was, you know, um, 96, 97. Uh, so this was around the uh, Olympic time. Um, and <laughs> so myself, Jeff Capel, um, it was uh, the wrong profit, Lamar Greer. Uh, I mean, some, some guys from Vanderbilt, uh, guys from Purdue, Arkansas. It was a bunch of guys. Terry Kittles was on that team. And, and for me, that was huge because I got a chance to see the best of the best from the ACC, the Big East, uh, the big East, uh, uh, SEC, and play with them and practice with them on a regular basis. And we went over to Europe. And we played against all of the teams that were going to play against our '96 Olympics. Okay, and then where did you where did you go in Europe? Uh, we went to Prague. We went to uh, Taiwan. We went to uh, uh, we went to the Czech Republic. Wow! Uh, you know, we went to like six different countries and played in some tournaments. And we had a chance to, you know, we won. We played, I mean, I had a chance to play against Yao Ming when he was young. When he was like 15, 16 years old. <laughs> Well, you certainly didn't. You didn't certainly didn't guard him, though, did you? No, 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 no. no. He, <laughs> right? Yeah, no. You have to. You have to worry about covering somebody six, seven, six, or whatever the hell Yao Ming was. You know? Yeah, they had Yao Ming. They had Wong Chi Chi. Okay. They had, they had some good players, and um, you know, so that summer was the summer that I really made the biggest jump because I was able that whole summer to play in the two or the three position full time. And so playing against those European players, the grown-ups, it really enhanced my ability as a player to to, to have that um, that time on the wing to be able to produce. And, you know, my, my three-point shot started to understand where where my three came from. Um, not just shooting, but to be able to develop different types of shots and, and to be able to guard the, guard the wing position full time. That was also another thing I had to learn how to do. Um, so and put the that, ball on the floor and go by people too. I imagine, right? The ball on the floor, you know, knowing that I didn't have a, any type of Kyrie Irving type handle, but I still <laughs> anywhere on the on the floor that I needed to with three, three, three to four dribbles, you know. All right. And that and that was the key. That was something that never got touched, that that got experienced before, right? You never got much experience at all putting the ball on the floor and going by people, right? Right. I was always the screen guy. So. Right. Um, I spent a lot of time screening and pop, picking and popping. Picking pop, yeah. Yeah, as opposed to, you know, being able to be, be the, the ball handler in the screen uh, and making plays and then, re, re, you know, like a Clay Thompson type thing where yeah. you come off the screen, give it up, and then you, uh, you know, um, put yourself in a position to get a shot off the second off the second, second wave of a, of a play, you know? All right. So, uh, the, if there's only one downside to your collegiate career, Rush, is uh, things didn't happen uh, for the best in the NCAA tournament. And how much is that a? I can't say a regret, but but how much does that hurt and still sting to this day that you guys didn't go as far as you wanted to in the NCAA tournament? Yeah, my senior year, we were supposed to win it, man. We we, we had Kentucky down twenty points, and uh, they came back and beat us by two, man. And that was that. Was, heartbreaking because uh, I felt like we had the best team in the country and uh, we had the best players, we had, we had the best players, the best brand, um, and you know, we just came up short and I think we just... And what was that, 98? Yeah, 98. Yeah. We lost to Kentucky, Tropicana Dome. 
Uh, but it, it was heart wrenching, you know. And I, 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 I see that game all the time being played, <laughs> and people will call me when it comes on. Oh really? No. Yeah. <laughs> in the world, yeah, I'm watching this game, man. It was killing them, and I'm like, but well, we lost. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that that's got to be the that's got to be the kicker uh, that that still stings a little bit to this day, right? That you didn't go further. Yeah, and, and the, the, the funny thing was Jeff Shepard, although he didn't stay the whole year, he he got, he got picked up in the second round by the Hawks. <laughs> oh, did he really? So okay. He was on that team, and you know, playing with him the, the following year was very very. It was funny because we were friends. And I and I was still good friends with guys like Scott Pageant, Nazi Muhammad, and uh, you know Hashimu Evans, the guys that were on that team. Okay. Uh, I was friends with those guys, so every chance they got, they got a chance to uh, remind me of uh, the outcome of that team. Okay. All right. So now you go to Chicago. You didn't go to Portsmouth, did you? You went to Chicago, the, the Compine, right? I Portsmouth was for guys. You know, after talking with my agent. Um, I felt like Portsmouth was for guys who weren't going to get drafted that were still trying to improve their their stock, and um, I just felt like I was going to get drafted. I just didn't. There was a couple teams that I knew that I spoke to that had a lot of interest, and um, and so I, I didn't feel like I needed to go to Portsmouth because I could do something to hurt my position. Okay. You know, if I wasn't, if I didn't have a great uh, showing, so. You know, but when I got to Chicago, that was different. You know, you got Dirk Nowitzki there, you got, you know, uh, Mike Zibby, you got, you know, all these guys, even the guys that didn't play, they were still there. Right. Because they, you know, had to be there. But being able to play against the guys who Matt Harpring and, you know, uh, guys like that. You know, Antoine Jameson, Vince Carter, those guys didn't have to play, but uh, Paul Pierce. And yeah, no. Guys a lot of ta there. lot of talent there. There's no question. All right, now there was... Uh, there was some sports writer at that time, um, I'm not going to mention any names, but a guy who was writing for the Star Ledger at that time who said that you had a disappointing showing in Chicago and that, that your, your, drive, your draft and stock drift, uh, di draft stock dipped. Okay? And, um, I didn't have a full showing. I was actually injured. Oh, you were injured. Is that true? See, I didn't get a chance to talk. I didn't get a chance to talk to you then, so I didn't know so that you're that you're injured. Yeah, but I, but my competitive edge is like this is a chance for me to move up. I mean, I can't do you know if I'm in the middle or at the bottom of wherever I'm at right now playing against these guys, my odds of moving up the ladder just would increase playing in Chicago because these are the guys that are getting drafted that are going to be in that late lottery. Mid lottery, mid 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 first round. Right. You know? So whether I played well or didn't play well, this was a different showing versus being in the Okay. So you yeah, didn't. I, was you, injured, I only played in like two games. Yeah. No. Yeah. I I I was in and out of there, so that was that's why it was really uh, really uh, weird of me to say what I did, but I. Um, uh, I mean, I'm just again. I didn't get a chance to talk to you either, then, because I so you. This is, what to, this is what led to Chicago being not so great where I got injured. So you know, I was you know prior to that, I was working out for teams. Oh, okay. I worked out for about thirteen teams leading up to that. All right. And right before, right before Chicago, I, I went to work out for the Celtics, and Rick Pitino was the coach. Ah. <laughs> well, he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna draft you no matter what, right? I mean, they okay. were interested big time because they didn't know if they would get Paul Pierce. Yeah. Uh, they thought Paul would go a little bit higher. Um, and what happened was, was there was supposed to be six guys at the workout. And, you know, when we got when I got there, guys didn't show up because they were getting ready for Chicago. And I showed up myself and Ruben Patterson. Okay. And we were like, man, where's everybody at, man? You know, like... So it was only the two of you? Yeah, just the two of us. Wow. And so... You know, the thing about those workouts, when you're by yourself, they're hard. But when you're with six people, you get more rest, so you can you can perform better. Right. Now you're doing more reps in the individuals when there's only two guys versus six guys. <laughs> <laughs> and so this dude decides to make us play 
one on one full court. After we finish one on one full court. Well, what what in God's name does anybody from a scouting uh, scouting standpoint get out of somebody playing one on one full court? I guess he was trying to see, see what our toughness was like. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Because we stopped as soon as we both grew up. <laughs> yeah. We looking at each other like we can't do this no more. So I grew up, you grew up, and it was over. <laughs> but, I, you know, my back was so sore. And I was just like, I can't, you know, but Chicago's the next day. And so I went into Chicago, beat up from this workout at Boston. Okay. And I, I, I was told not to play. But, I, you know, my competitive edge, I, I decided to play. I okay. I was decision to play in the two games that I did. And, but I, and it wasn't the greatest games I played, but at the same time, they knew I was injured. So, okay. Um, and I was just getting therapy. But I just was like, man, I can't let this opportunity pass up. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a competitor. All right. <laughs> so, uh... So what what was your reaction when you read that there was a guy who you knew from Jersey City who wrote for the Star Ledger and said that you had a disappointing showing and and your draft stock had plummeted? What was your reaction when you said, "Man, doesn't this guy know me right now? What is what is this thing you're talking about?" Well, actually, I talked to coach about that, and it was funny because I was like, I already by that time I knew I was going for the I knew I was going to Columbus. You knew then. Uh, yeah, I knew I was going to the Hawks because the workout with the Hawks, I dominated everybody. Okay. We had about eight people at the workout, and they weren't even close. You know, um, and you know what? Well, I didn't know. I, I'm not. Let me rephrase that. My, my agent knew I was going to the Hawks. Okay. And so, uh, but you know, he would always tell. Well, me how come you didn't clue me in and tell me you were going to the Hawks then? How come you know you left me out there to dry? Oh, that's because I left you out there to dry. Okay. I was going to go to one of three teams, Houston, Orlando, or, or Atlanta. Okay. Because Orlando had three picks, Houston had three picks, and they're all in the first round before 20. Yep. <laughs> and so I knew that I was going to go to one of those three teams. Okay. Um, and I had my best workouts with all three of those teams. Okay. Uh, Orlando took me at Harper. Um, hold on one second. Orlando took Matt Harper. Houston had, you know, they just traded for Scottie Pippen, so they ended up taking a European player uh, who, who they never brought over to play uh, because they had just picked up Scottie Pippen. Yeah, but didn't they didn't they package some of their picks to, to, uh, with, to, to, with a trade with the Nets with Richard Jefferson too? Was that part of that? Wasn't that part of that draft? No. Uh, no, it, was, it wasn't with it wasn't with the Nets. It was. Um, it was with, um, I forget who, I forget who it was with. All right. You know, they had three picks, and they packaged three of those picks. Yeah. And they ended up picking, uh, I think it was Ray for Austin or something like that. Uh, somebody, but he okay. traded somewhere else. I can't remember exactly. That's right. Name, but, but once, once um, you know, we were downtown at the, at the restaurant, uh, <laughs> early, and everybody, and once Houston made their picks, and they picked the small forward. Once Orlando picked Matt Harper, and they picked the small forward, I pretty much knew I was going to Orlando. All right. Well, if you remember, the ledger at that time had me. They wanted me to go wherever Al Harrington was going. They wanted they wanted me to write about Al Harrington getting drafted wherever it was. So I did a whole bunch of stories about Al Harrington beforehand, and I had a talk to, you know, his high school coaches and, and everybody to talk about where Al Harrington was going to go. So then they were sending me to Vancouver to the, to the draft. They were, I was, I had a plane ticket and hotel reservation to go to Vancouver to go to the draft. And then all of a sudden, uh, Harrington starts, his agent starts getting word that he's not getting picked as a lottery pick and his stock is dropping like nobody's business. So they said, okay, you go wherever Al Harrington's going. So, incredibly, Al Harrington has a draft party in a, in a restaurant in South Orange. And, incredibly, they wouldn't let me in. They wouldn't let anybody in. So, now I'm covering the draft by peeking my head in the window. And all of a sudden, I notice who goes 20 overall 
but Rashad McLeod ahead of Al Harrington, right? So now I have to run across the street to a payphone. I call Rosie Radigan. I call Rosie Radigan and said, "Is it right?" I said, "Is there any possible way that I could talk to?" I first asked for Brian Doherty. I said, in right. Bri Bri I said, hey, Brian, is Rashawn there with you? He goes, yeah, he is. He goes, can I talk to him? So then sure enough, I got you on the phone, and I'm interviewing you on the pay phone on a street in South Orange, and I'm interviewing you about the, the, the Hawks and, and what it was like for you to get drafted by the Hawks and blah, blah, blah. But you, when you first got on the phone, your first do you remember your first reaction was to me on the phone? No, that I don't remember. All right, I'm going to tell you what it was. So I said, hey, besides Jim Hagen, you went, ah -ha! Meaning, like, <laughs> you proved me wrong. Because I said you were going to drop out of the first round and get picked in the second round. And you got picked in the first round. And you went, ah -ha! And I went, oh, okay. So now you let that slide. And now we're talking. And then all of a sudden, while I'm on the phone with you, you said, hey, Jim, you better go. Why? Your boy just got taken. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go run back across the street to see if I could get into this restaurant to see if I could talk to Al Harrington. And lo and behold, they still wouldn't let me in. So I got to be, I got to interview you uh, on a payphone from South Orange when obviously I could have been in Jersey City at Rosie Radigan's. But no, I had to go follow Al Harrington, and I was at a in, in a restaurant they wouldn't let me into. So, and I had to cover the NBA draft from a payphone in South Orange, and you got picked ahead of Al Harrington. And that's the that's my lasting memory of that pick. But I remember when you got put Brian Brian put you to the phone, and you got on the phone, and you went ah, and I was like, okay, you got me. I was just like, no. Oh, no, oh, it's definitely you. No, but what, you know, shame on me for doubting you again. Like, I only doubted you, I don't know, how many times in your life. And here I had one last chance to not doubt you, and I did. See? So, anyway. Oh, that's a great memory, and I tell that to everybody. That I, you know, they said, well, what was that like? Well, I could have been at the NBA draft in Vancouver, which was a beautiful city. I mean, I love Vancouver. So I could have been there to cover the NBA draft, but no. Where was I? On a payphone, because yeah, that's before cell phones, on a payphone in uh, in South Orange, on a payphone, covering the NBA draft and having to talk to two people, you first and then Al Harrington. But the best was, hey, Jim, you better go. Why? Your boy just got text. You, your boy just got pissed. I went, oh no! And I said, okay, Rox, take care. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. You know, and, and ran across the street. So, anyway, uh, were you happy uh, about getting? First of all, you had to be happy getting taken in the first round. But were you happy with Atlanta? Was you, were you happy with that? That was going to be a great place for you to play. Um, I was because it was it was where I wanted to go. Um, you know, I wanted to play. In Atlanta, because it was, first of all, it's a great city, obviously. But they had a team of vets uh, with Steve Smith and Tombo and Mookie Blaylock, you know, guys like that. Um, and, and, and they didn't really have a whole lot of guys at my position, which was a small forward position. You know, Tyrone Corbin was in his 15th year position, you know, at his size, you know, being really thin. Um, so I had an opportunity to, to come in and play. And then I get there and realize that oh, as great as Lenny Wilkins is, <laughs> he don't like playing rookies. <laughs> yeah, no, that was the rumor. Yeah, he didn't like playing rookies. <laughs> that was a rumor I had heard until I, until I got there and, and didn't get as much playing time as I would have liked. Um, but when he gave me opportunity to play, I just showed him that I could. You know, the games that I started throughout the year and the games where I played significant minutes, I was, I was efficient and effective. Okay. I mean, I remember going on the West Coast trip where we had about, you know, 11 games in 13 days, and I started half the games because, you know, when you're on a trip like that, you got to reserve guys and you got to do things. And I, I think I averaged about 15, 16 points a game in that stretch. Yep. And, uh, and you know, had a chance of playing dirt, playing in Phoenix, playing against, you know, all of West Coast teams. 
and then we get home and I just play five games in a row. <laughs> wow. All right. So like, I would have rather played at home than to play on the road. Yeah. yeah. All right, when, when was it, and now you had a pretty good rookie season, and then all of a sudden, your sophomore, your sophomore, your second year in the NBA is when the injury started, and, you know, did you, how serious was it? It was, it was, it was the third, it was my, my second year, I was pretty good, I started probably, um, I think I was like 13 and 14, and I think I second year. Oh, you did, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, and, but, and, you know, my, my, all my statistics went up. Um, I was able to, to put together, I went from averaging six points to eight points um, a game. And then, uh, so I had a pretty really good second season, but then, you know, that, that's the year <laughs> they end up trading uh, a bunch of, like Steve Smith to Portland and coming to Miami. Was it Miami? I might have been Portland. Um, I forget which team it was, but we got there. It was Portland because we got Dale Ryder. Right. <laughs> And then we drafted Jason Terry uh, that year as well. Lenny left. We ended up getting um, uh, the coach from Oklahoma right now, uh, Lon Kruger. Lon Kruger, right. Uh -huh, who, was, who was a great college coach, but just didn't have the, the authority to put guys in their place at the time. You know, he was playing to guys who go with Jimmy Jackson and Al Alan Henderson. You know, it, it, it was it, it was a little bit over his head. I mean, okay. The of coaches he is, it was just a little bit over his head. You know, the guys don't react to him the way that they do in college when you make a decision. You know, that decision by pro is going to get challenged. It's not just going to be okay when the coach made a decision. And, you know, now a player may go to the media. <laughs> okay. A player may go to the GM and be like, I'm on that. And it always comes back to the coach. Um, so, you know, he just didn't have the experience to, you know, because he went from being a, a college head coach to a pro head coach, and obviously you don't run a pro team the way you would run a college team. Right. So, but when did the, when did the injury take place? And uh, it was the summer going into my third year. Wow. When I got injured, it was a uh, summer league. Is that true? You got hurt in the summer league? Wow. Yeah, I got hurt in the summer league. So, down, in, down the Jersey Shore League? This was in the, um, in the NBA Summer League. Oh, the, in the NBA Summer League, okay. They used to have, before they had it the way it is today, it used to be one in Orlando, one in Atlanta, one in Utah. Right. And um, we were playing against Orlando, and I went up for a, re a, a rebound, and I got the rebound, came down, and I my buckled my knee on Matt Harper's leg. Like on his ankle, I stepped on his foot, and my knee buckled. And I pinched the nerves. But at the time, I didn't know I pinched the nerves. So I played, finished the game. I finished with like 28 points. I mean, I was having a great time knowing that this is the year that I'm going to go into my third season as a starter full time. Um, and I, just, I couldn't finish the summer. The next day, I woke up. I could barely walk. I couldn't feel my leg. And, you know, they didn't understand what, was, what had happened at the time. And, you know, they just kept wanting me to play in the summer league because I was playing so well. And it was a, it was an opportunity for me to establish myself. Um, but I couldn't play, and I ended up missing the rest of the summer. Um, and then uh, that, that, summer, that year was the year that my mom passed away, and all the things started happening. When, uh, when my mom passed away in October, um, uh, and, and a bunch of things started happening to me physically, like nobody was telling me that I was just getting physical therapy for a calf strain, when I, in, in actuality, I had a pinched nerve. Oh, wow. And, and so it wasn't until I got traded that year with the Kimbe to Philadelphia where I found out that that was a, a nerve So I played about 50 games that year, you know, and I was, I was, I was started off the season averaging about maybe 15 a game. Yeah. And, uh, and I was having a great season, but I couldn't sustain it physically, uh, because of the, because of the pinched nerve. And then it got to the point where I couldn't even walk. Um, and then I got traded with the Kimbe. Um, it's funny because I got traded laying on the on the uh, table, getting physical therapy one morning. I, I opened the paper up and it's like big trade. Oh, the man is over with Sean McLeod going to Philly, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get to Philly and I'm excited. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm going to do my best to get healthy because I still don't know what's wrong. So I'm going to physical therapy and everything is going great. I, you know, I play in my first game against Indiana. Um, and, and I just couldn't run. I just, I couldn't, I had no speed. I couldn't change direction. And I'm like, man, there's something really wrong with me. Whatever they told y'all is wrong with me. It's something worse than that. So I need to go see a specialist.
potentially soon. So I'll, the, the, the training that was from the um, from the Sixers was like, what is the issue? Like, what is the feeling? So I was like, I, I was like, no. And he was like, I have numbness. It's a nerve. It's a nerve problem. So then I went to see a neurologist, and then we actually found out what the problem was. And what was the problem? I had coronial nerve entrapment. My, my perineal nerve was entrapped between my tibia and tibia. Oh, my so God. I wasn't getting, any, I wasn't getting any, any electric shock going down all the way through from my knee down to my toes. Okay. So I could barely feel what was happening. So when I was running and walking, it was almost like I was, I, was, I didn't have my limb connected. Okay. And so, you know, I missed the rest of that season because I had to have surgery a week later because I had played so many games on it. And the doctor was like, man, this is going to, because you played so many games on it, it's going to take forever to heal because nerves, you can't do anything, you can't cut your nerves. No, you can't. You know, and they take forever to heal. They take right. forever to heal. Yeah. And so by going through that, it took forever to heal. I get traded to Boston, which I thought was a great opportunity. Um, and uh, I go into preseason, having only had a short summer to, to get ready. And uh, we are, we're in, uh, we're in the, like preseason, getting ready to play, and I'm out there shooting, and I'm in the starting lineup. <laughs> but, uh, and who was the coach of Boston then? Uh, Jim O'Brien. Jim O'Brien, okay. And uh, so I'm, I went up for a shot, landed, and landed kind of awkwardly in the warm-ups, and my leg went down <laughs> again. And uh, you know, and then it went back in. So, because it was there for so long, it was just used to being there, so it, it popped back in, and I missed the whole season. As a result of it, just because there was no, no more operations to have, it was like, you just got to let it heal. And I'd probably say I got the feeling back in my leg in 2011. Wow, oh my God. <laughs> was when I got to, but prior, you know, prior to even all that, I ended up rushing my Achilles tendon from overcompensating so much because of the injury. Oh my God. So on my other, on the other side, I ruptured my Achilles tendon, um, trying to rehab and do things and overcompensation. And then once I got the Achilles, and then I had the knee, it was like, ah, eh, it's pretty much done now. So let's let's keep it moving and try something new. Try something new, and that and that new was uh, eventually led to coaching. And uh, and the first job you took, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was at Fairfield University, right? 2003. Okay, and what was that like to be coaching on the on the collegiate level? Um, I didn't really like it, honestly. Um, you, you didn't like I, it at all. I did. I, I, I enjoyed the player development side of it, but what I didn't enjoy, I still wanted to play. Okay. <laughs> and because I still wanted to play, it was tough being around the game. And then for me, um, you know, I just and you know, like I said, I was recently. Lost my mom, and then I got married, so a lot of things was going on, and, um, you know, being young still, I didn't know how to handle all of the emotions and everything that was going. I was lost, and I was depressed, and I was, you know, I was going through a bunch of things, emotions that I just needed to find myself, so I didn't stay there that, I didn't stay there as long as I would have liked to, to be able to upstart my basketball career, looking back at it now, my best coaching career. But um, I still needed to, to deal with the emotional stress and the depression and all the things that I was going through in order to do anything to move forward in my life. Okay. Were you ever were you ever diagnosed with depression? Did you you know Did you ever yeah, go I, see I, somebody I, with that? Yeah, my wife helped me find a place um, called Pass that was over in um, I think that place that um, and Pass. Yeah, I can't remember exactly where it was in New Jersey at the time. But All right, so you moved back and you were living up here. Yeah, uh, and this was like, you know, uh, this was 2011. I was coaching at Benedict. Okay. Well, when you, you jumped, well, you jumped the gun a little bit. You so you jumped the gun a little bit. How how did you get uh, approached with the idea of becoming the head coach at Benedict's? And how influential was your friend Brian Doherty with that? So I was coaching at Indiana. Oh, that's right. You were at University of Indiana for a while, right? Right. I was coaching with Tom Crane at Indiana, and that didn't work out. Um, 
work out so hard. Like I said, I was going through depression and then playing for a guy like Tom. Um, you know, for lack of a better term, I'm gonna just keep it simple because I don't, you know, I don't want to bring up old. He wasn't the right guy that I should have been coaching with. Okay. <laughs> um, and you know, he made the job not fun because while I was going through my depression. Okay. And so it it really put a bad taste in my mouth about wanting to coach at the collegiate level because of the way that he he and I were, you know, we didn't have the best of relationship as well. I mean, it wasn't like I hated him. It's just his coaching style. Intense is the underword. Is the under is the understatement. He's very intense. Yes, I know. Uh, and so, you know, all that to say, uh, when I left Indiana, uh, Danny ended up getting the Wagner job. That's right. And so, Danny was very instrumental and also helped me get that. And Coach K was also helpful, helpful and talking with Father Head and knowing Father Head and him knowing me and knowing my relationship with Ryan Darty and how Ryan helped the school and, you know, and, and, and um, and how long was Brian gone already at that point? He was gone, right? Yeah, he was gone by then, but he, he you know, just, uh, Father Ed knew of my relationship, obviously, with Brian. Okay. So, having a guy like myself come home, you know, obviously, being leaving, me being a, a product of the Hurley, you know, family and uh, St. Anthony's product, I, I thought it was a great opportunity for me to start off being a head coach, but I wasn't ready because, like I said, I was still going through depression at the time. Okay. And so, although I was a good coach, I wasn't mentally prepared for the position. All right. Did you know did, did it hurt, Rosh, that you had to worry about two teams? That you had to worry about the uh, the four-year team and the postgraduate team, too? We actually got rid of the prep team. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, we, we got rid of the prep team and had one team because I felt like it would be a little too much. Um, and when we didn't retain Mike Cabongo, it wasn't only for me to try to start a whole, you know, everybody left. I right. The only person stayed was Andrew Smith. And so it wasn't like the, the cover was absolutely there. I had to recruit everybody all over. Um, and, and I, you know, I did a really good job. I mean, he had the talent. I just didn't have the emotion. I didn't have the ability to, to take the personalities at the time as a head coach and gel the talent together. Okay. I mean, we had top ten talent, but I just I was I would give myself a few plus as a coach. I knew how to get them ready to play. I didn't know how to put the the, the, the condiments together. You know, the, 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 we had a great burger, but we didn't have the right amount of pepper. We didn't have the right amount of you know ketchup. And all <laughs> it's only food. fitting that you're talking about burgers right now as you as you're cooking burgers at the same time, right? Yeah, I'm looking right at it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how many years were you there? I was there for one year. Just one year? Okay. Just one year. I mean, I was ready to be there for the rest of my whole career, but I don't think you had the patience to be able to wait for me to learn how to be a head coach. Okay. So, and, they, and so that was, after that, I, I learned that I was depressed, and then I started to take on my own, uh, you know, life and just go out and, and I started to see someone, and I started to really understand what I was going to do as a person. Okay. And then uh, how did the, how did the move to Atlanta take place? Um, my wife, uh, when, I, when, I, when I wasn't coaching anymore, my wife and I, we both started to, you know, work. And, you know, I was working over in Chelsea at a school called Fashion Industries High School and um, working with the New York uh, School of Education, Board of Education. And uh, <clears throat> so... You know, it just got to the point where we got tired of the snow. Okay. It's like I'm moving back to Atlanta because um, if you're not going to be working here, just, I want to be back in Atlanta. She wanted to have a child, so and we wanted to raise our kids in Atlanta because we just felt like it was uh, a better place to raise our son at the time. Okay. And is your wife from Atlanta? No, my wife, we met in Atlanta. My wife's from Illinois. Illinois, okay. Yeah. All right, and so now... 
what are you doing in? Tell everybody what you're doing in Atlanta now, and uh, uh, what is what are some of the things that you're involved with? So um, I'm a real estate agent here in Atlanta. Uh, I work with a, a, also a program called the Hype Hawks, where I do a lot of their personal development player day program. Um, um, I also am a part of an organization called ParentUSA.org. And what we are is a, a nonprofit that is, um, what we try to do is offer opportunity for parents to have resources to be, become the best parents and give their kids the life that every kid deserves. And, um, you know, we're uh, a growing organization and, and, you know, we want to be able to do more, especially in this time, uh, because we feel like with all the, the events that are happening, you know, family dynamic and family um, uh, the family uh, dynamic is the one thing that can help change, um, regardless of your race or you know whatever or creed or whatever. You know, parents are the things that are going to teach their kids the most. That they, well, they should teach what they kids need to know the most. That's true. That's what the most important thing. All right, and then are you involved with basketball at all? Say it again. Are you involved with the sport of basketball at all? I do a lot of their, uh, I do a lot of their um, uh, corporate sponsorship stuff. Um, uh, I work with the Hawks a lot, uh, doing some of those things. Um, and like I said, I do. I was coaching off and on at some different schools, but um, where we come from, the, the private school was king. <laughs> okay. In the South, the, the public school was king. Okay. And for for a while, I was searching for the right private school to coach at, but at the end of the day, trying to a public school is king. Okay. have the resources to do it. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just involved with AU and personal development right now. Okay. All right. So I'm, all... I'm going to get back into coaching. One, uh, one of my goals is to, I'd like to start doing some scouting in the NBA. So I'm tapping into my resources with the community. Good. Uh, to, to figure out um, how to get forward with the um, Scouting, you know, I'm, I'm, right now I'm fortunate. You know, my roommate Trajan is at in New Orleans, and one of my teammates helped was in Philly, and Quinn Snyder's in in Utah. So they were all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. Some opportunities out there. Just gotta make sure that I'm, you know, talking to those guys regularly and giving them an idea of what I'm looking for, so we try to find a good fit. Okay. Trajan is the GM with the Pelicans, isn't he? Correct. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, Great guy. He was with the he was with the Nets for a while when I was covering the Nets. I got to sit, sit okay. and talk with him a couple of times then. So he's a he's a he's a really really good guy. So uh, all all things considered, Raj, how how you know? I mean, obviously you would have liked your NBA career to go a little bit longer than what it did. But all all things considered, you know, you're a kid from Jersey City who got a chance to to play at the highest level both on collegiate and in the NBA. And how fortunate do you feel uh, about your life? And well, first, before we close up, let's talk a little bit about your wife and your family. You said you got three children, and talk about a little. First, let's give your wife credit. What's your wife's name, and what does she do? Um, Tiffany. Um, Tiffany McLeod is my wife's name, and she works at Marietta City Schools here. Okay. In, in, uh, in Georgia, uh, she's a parent liaison. Um, she works with um, the privileged youth, making sure that the parents are involved in their education. Um, so that's what she does, and we have three kids, uh, one to 25, he just graduated from college last year, um, fluent Japanese speaker, um, he, uh, he also uh, is a musician um, as well, so he's you know, a pretty intelligent guy, making his way out in the real world now, my daughter's going to be a junior this year coming up, and she wants me to be a veterinarian or OBGYN. Wow, where does she, and where does she go to school? Right now, she's at Kennesaw State. Kennesaw State, okay. From, uh, from Georgia State. All right. Uh, and so, and then we have a five-year-old, Roman, who's probably going to, you know, take what I, what I did with the game and, and make it a little bit better. And I think with the experiences that I went through, um, the, the, you know, the, the relationships that I've been able to accumulate um, in my time doing this, uh, he'll have a a great opportunity to do some great things with uh, with the game of basketball. And at five, he's already uh, uh, he loves the game already. So and he's dunking with both hands already. Uh, on his on his five foot 
foot jabber he is. <laughs> <laughs> Like four feet tall and six oh feet my gosh! Really solid, yeah, solid. Yeah. Well, just keep the ball in his hands. I That's all that matters. Some, keep the. I just send you some uh, videos of uh, his workouts, man. He gets his workouts in every day. Oh, would love to see. Would love to see it. So, all right. Now, all things and, and how blessed are you to have such a great family and have a great life? And uh, you know, how, how blessed are you that you'd be able to to have uh, the you know the blessings of a family, especially. This close to Father's Day, and uh, to, you know, it must be a, a great feeling knowing fully well that uh, God graced you with a, a great wife and a great family. Yeah, we coming up. This is um, it's funny because we got Father's Day on Sunday tomorrow, and then our anniversary is on Monday, which is awesome. So we coming up, uh, finishing up our 18th year married, um, a marriage, and, you know. Our family dynamic is really good because, you know, we got so much love for each other. Um, we got some uh, goals as far as how we want to raise our children. Um, you know, so we see eye to eye in a lot of those areas. So it makes it a little bit easier for us to do. Beautiful. Um, but there's nothing like a family man, where, you know, you're not, you don't feel alone. And, you know, you can also uh, rely on them and they got your back. So yep. That's always a good thing. All right, and I know you'd never turn your back on your Jersey City roots. I know you keep in touch with a lot of the guys that you played with. You come home, you played in that Jersey City Legends game a couple of years ago, and that you know that must have been a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, and um. I see a lot of faces, man, but you know my playing days are over. Yeah. Well, next time they have it, you can just come and sit sit there and sign autographs. You know. Yeah. Um, playing, um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work my way back into some, and not even gonna say playing shape, but better shape than I am now. And we'll see how that looks, man. Because I think if I, if I can get to about 250, I might be able to get the MVP. Yeah. Oh, that's what they're, they, yeah, that's what they're all hoping for. So, although, uh, what, what, what's it called? Like, uh, who's the guy who every year makes sure that he's, he's, he claims the, the, uh, the, the MVP before it even starts. Oh, okay. Well, it ain't Bobby. Bobby never claims that he's going to be the MVP, but it's uh, it's not Kieran, is it? No. It's, uh, no, come on. Oh, he's terrible. He's oh, terrible. No, so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think who. I think, I think it's, um, what's his name? Uh, the kid he played, I think he played at Ferris. Real humble kid, though. Um, uh, man, right? Yeah, Mike, Mike, Michael Wright played, I think he played one year, uh, but he, he didn't have such a great game. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Hadn't seen him since. <laughs> all right. But all, all, all things considered, you you never want to turn your back on your Jersey City roots. That's for, for sure. I keep in contact with, uh, with all the guys I played with that are there. When I come home, my family's still there. My dad's still there. Um, so, you know, it's as much as I can. Um, I, I will be getting back home soon. Uh, once this whole craziness, you know, calms down a little bit, uh, just because of this, I had a chance to bring my five-year-old up there, get on the path train, get on the subway, so give him some of those experience that I had when I was a kid. So. Beautiful. All right. So to sum it all up, how you know how fortunate that you've been? Uh, do you feel that you were able to make a life out of basketball, to play it at the highest level, and uh, to be accepted? As being, you know, an All-American, a first-round draft pick, and uh, somebody who had a really, really good life in basketball. Um, I, I mean, I would give it a ten out of ten. Man. I mean, I just, you know, for a guy that came from Georgia City who really didn't see, you know, I didn't even see basketball as an option and as a middle schooler, and then be able to develop the way that I did um, with, the, with the type of coaches that I was able to play for, uh, the type of teammates that I was able to play with. Um, the experiences I was able to have all around the country, all around the world. I mean, you know, a, a young kid from Jersey City, man, that, that's, you know, that's a dream come true. So, you know, if, if you put the work in and you listen to the right people, <laughs> you know, that can be a dream for another kid. So hopefully I can, you know, have conversations with some of the kids who are from Jersey City and, you know, even where I am today to give them a chance to to get out there and get, put their best foot forward and, and be able to accomplish some of those things as well. Well, Rashawn, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me two times. 
Um, you you uh, you now have the distinction of being one of only two people to have two hours uh, on the Jersey City, the Hudson County Sports Podcast. And the other one was not Coach Early, but he's waiting. He's waiting patiently for his second hour. He wants it badly, but uh, but, but but that's that's that's, that's, that's for your that's distinction. Playing the game, they're playing the game on ESPN right now, and I just got a, I just got a text from Ryan Whalen. <laughs> oh, you're kidding! And who and who's who's the game that's on right now? Yeah, that's the Duke Carolina game. Oh, the Duke Carolina game. Okay. Yeah, watching you on ESPN right now. Time flies. Hope all is well. All right. Well, I'm gonna have to go turn it on right now and check and take a look at the the player that I badly misscouted twice in his in his career. Gosh, I really appreciate you. And so are you mine. I mean, I know nobody, nobody I adored more than you, baby. You know, I, I just miss, I miss the fact that you were too tall to play for my bitty basketball team. But other than that, I was, you know, I, I had it all set for you to play. So, Rashawn, great talking to you, pal. You take care of yourself, and thanks so much for sharing a few minutes with us. And uh, and we will keep in touch. Thanks, Jeff. All right, you take care of yourself. Happy Father's Day. Same to you. All right, bye bye. And that was Rashawn McLeod. Uh, with this week's uh, Hudson County Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Haig, and with a special thanks again, once again, to my executive producer, Johnny Haig. Without him, this would have never happened. Uh, he's my great uncle. I'm, I'm, I'm his great uncle. He's my great nephew. Uh, and uh, he's the one that helped put this all together. And we're now still going strong with the Hudson County Sports Podcast. So thanks very much for listening, and we'll have another edition of the Hudson County Sports Podcast sometime next week. Thanks again. Good talking to you. Take care now.